So the Marx Brothers, let's kind of give you a, a catch up on what you think you know about the Marx Brothers, because what we all know about them is the Marx Brothers as film stars, movie stars. Um, what most people may not be aware of is that they were also the, the highest paid vaudevillian star team uh, until they stopped doing vaudeville and became the highest paid, most successful Broadway stars. So they were at the complete top of their game um, before they became movie stars. And then Groucho, of course, became a radio star and then a television star with You Bet Your Life. So he had an amazing career that went from doing little vaudeville theaters in the, the backwoods of this country when he was a boy all the way through to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when he was um, kind of at the height of his, uh, his fame. Um, and they had a wild childhood. Harpo also played the piano, also in a whorehouse on Long Island. Um, Zeppo was being arrested for stealing small things, you know. So mom said, no, 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 you're all going to be in an act and go to, and you're joining your poor unfortunate brother and you're going to be touring the country. And, and so they started, tried, they came up with a, a vaudeville act. A lot of comedy came from uh, ethnic types, immigrants. And so uh, Groucho was doing what they called back then a German dialect character. And they had really thick German, fake German accents. And so the whole, fun they, whole, the whole fun they made of the German immigrant was not assimilating and not being able to understand them. And, and so Groucho was a German teacher with a big black furry mustache glued on. Um, and he was the teacher. Uh, Chico was based on an Italian immigrant character, and so that's where his Italian accent started to be developed. He was basically what they used to call, please don't be offended, they used to call it the WAP character. That was the name for that, that ethnic type, immigrant type. Um, and Harpo was based on the, what they call him, the Mick character, the Irish immigrant. So he had a bright red curly wig. He had little freckles, big freckles drawn on like howdy doody. And he had a bad Irish accent. And he was just, he couldn't sing and he didn't like to learn lines. So one day his uncle said, well, we're not going to have you talk anymore. And so he never spoke on stage ever again. <laughs> and he was thrilled by it. On YouTube, there's only one recording ever found of his voice. And he basically says like two words into this microphone. And so nobody really knows what his voice was like, but he could talk. Um, so they developed these characters in, in, the, in vaudeville and they literally traveled the entire country back and forth all over it by train. It's the only way to travel. They were doing this like between 1901 and 1918, 1919. So these four boys are traveling by train to all of these little tiny towns all over the country. And like you just follow the map and they're just like this. And, and um, eventually they grew to become really, really popular. Um, and then in a card game, some friend of theirs started giving them nicknames. And that's where Groucho got his nickname because he was a grouch. And Harpo, obviously, from the harp. Gummo, because he wore shoes that had gum soles on them. And Chico, I told you about Chico. And Zeppo, uh, no one knows where Zeppo came from. There's a lot of theories. The Zeppelin was popular. There was a Zeppo, Zippo lighter, you know. That's the, the myth. Um, so they became um, really, really, really... Um, famous and very rich in vaudeville. They went to the very, very top of the vaudeville, playing at the biggest, biggest palaces in New York. The musicals back then were gigantic. And there were, in Animal Crackers, there was an enormous chorus, big chorus scenes. So um, when you do it on stage, there was a, a revival in the early 80s, and um, it was the first time it had been revived. And it had the big, huge cast and it was, you know, it wasn't something you could just do because A, the challenges of finding the Marx Brothers is very big. And then B, you have this huge company. So I, I went up to Ashland a couple years ago and I saw this production of Animal Crackers up there. And 
uh, Henry Wischkamper, who is a, direct, a national known director, had adapted the script to, to, to boil it down to nine actors, no chorus, with making the gimmick of, that, of the show that every actor plays multiple characters. And it's a quick change show. The gimmick of the show is that they literally, in some cases, walk off stage and five lines later walk on as a different character in a full change of costume. Um, we also have Russell, who plays Hives, and Chandler. He actually changes from one character to the other on stage in one line. Um, it's just, the, you know, it's, it's just part, adds to the craziness of the show. But it, mean, it meant that we were able to do this show in our theater because we now can afford to do it. It's a smaller show that fits our, our theater. And um, when we're doing our production, um, Josh, who plays, um, Joshua Des Rubin, who plays uh, Groucho, um, I said, Josh, you're allowed to riff the audience, riff off of them. You're allowed to have fun with them. Um, no one else in the show is allowed to go off script. So you can't, they can't change a word. So if, if Groucho is playing, if we're saying a scene with Groucho's character Spalding, and he decides to wander off the script, you're not allowed to say anything. You just have to sit there and take it. And that's part of the fun, is watching him torture the other characters who just have to go, yes, 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 yes. When are we going to be done with that? Yes. Um, so we had to create an environment for them to play in. And uh, the set, as described, is a doorway at the top of the stage, and the band is on stage. And that's kind of all they gave us. And so... Um, since we had just done on the 20th century, which was a art deco, an art deco set, we're like, oh my God, we have to do another art deco set? How do we make these not look alike? And so I said, I know who could do that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Sean Fanning, um, and I did the set. <laughs> um, so yeah, we ended up with another art deco set this this season, or well, it's actually it's, it's it's another season, so it's okay. You know, we're allowed to do that. Um, but you know, that wasn't the first impulse when I when I first read the play. I said, okay, so it takes place at some um, East Coast socialized home. This set has to has to be a lot of things. It can't just be a literal realistic house because then why do you have a band on stage? You know, none of it makes any sense. And so it really becomes more like a variety show. Yeah. And that's kind of how I started thinking about it, which is that it just kind of represents the house at times, but at other times there's a, you've got this band on You're stage welcome. and you're very aware whoa, that there's whoa, not it. Whoa, 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 we're going to need them later. Haven't you ever heard of word of mouth? So it really is a set. It's a set of a set. Um, you know, one thing I thought was important when I was working on it was the color palette felt incredibly touchy to me because watching those films and watching them growing up, I always remember seeing them in black and white. And I, I can't really remember ever seeing any of the Marx Brothers in color. So there's something about that, that monochromatic palette that seemed important to me. And so that kind of going in, I thought it was something very colorful and it just wasn't working. It felt like it could be a set for some other play. And as soon as I drained the color out of it, um, I said, that's it. Because I can, now that these guys are in color, I can pick them out. I know where to look. And so by controlling our color palette, um, we're able to create focus on stage. I think the other part of it was um, creating a space for movement, creating a space for comedy. And so, you know, this is a thrust stage, you know, we've got the audience on three sides of the stage. And so it really becomes, how do you get, and I say this at every designer forum, it's how do you get actors to come out past the proscenium and make it not seem stupid, you know? Like, how do you motivate, why are they going out there, you know? And um, for this set, it, it really became about making this I mean, I call it a tongue. Um, it's the sort of tongue that sticks out past the proscenium and it forces them as they come into the room to come out 
into the audience, and so it just automatically it, it, it engages the thrust. And from that came this idea of circles, and so there's this circular set of steps, and then everything else kind of curves around it, and that um, geography seems to work really well for like the concentric movement that happens when you've got people kind of chasing each other around the room. I think what else? We have some some fun stuff on stage. Yeah, the piano. The, uh, that that also became a really big influential um, piece because it, it, you've got to have a piano on stage, and so that ended up making everything wider. You know, we had to widen the area that I had for the band in order to accommodate um, that real estate. And it's also important that people see um, playing the piano. Uh, so we can't just bury the musicians in the back like we often do. So the musicians become a really important part of the stage picture and they, they get engaged with what's happening with the actors and everything. And so they really are part, part of the action. I think the show is even funnier when, they, when there's that interaction and you've got the bass player sort of sitting back there up on that step. And as people try to run around the room, he's got to get out of the way. I mean, it's just all very... It's very self-conscious, it's very self-aware, and that's one of the things I think makes the show fun. Uh, you know, it's, it's the show like really a is a, a costume well, event, a I think. So and that's okay. Maybe and so a lot of money, what the set you? has to do is, is do its job and then make way for the I'm costumes. Good. And so controlling the color palette was an important part of that. Um, but what she does with color, if you see the show, is just phenomenal. And some of her costumes are just so um, just they, they just pop, and um, and so I really didn't want to compete with that at all because it really is about um, some of those surprise entrances, surprise costumes. This whole thing is about the set putting something on stage and then getting out of the way and letting these characters take over, and that's really what it is. And I'm proud of how it's turned out. So 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 when we're talking about costuming. Um, because the quick changes happen so fast, some, especially at the beginning of the show, people have two or three costumes layered, so they're peeling off layers rather than adding things on. Um, things are rigged, shirts are rigged, but, uh, buttons are, are replaced with magnets. Um, I put my best friend and poor Russell in a fat suit, um, and he's wearing a fat suit and two costumes over that. Um, you're welcome, you're welcome. Um, to really top off the, the huge difference in these characters is the way their hair looks and their makeup, which is a really important part of the show. And Peter has put together some fabulous looks for all of these actors who play multiple characters. So I know um, there are a couple times when, before you catch on, where you're a little bit like, who is that? And then you realize, oh, that's a person in a completely different outfit, different wig, different everything. Um, which means I think Peter is successful. But you want to talk about some of these wigs, including the Louis the Fifteenth Court, which are these huge Marie Antoinette monstrosities? Uh, I think probably the funniest thing is, I guess I'm always the one for a challenge, because I was sitting at a friend's pool one day and I'm reading the production reports because they get sent out after a rehearsal and it says, the one court wig needs a bird cage in it. And I'm going, oh, I've never done a bird cage. That can be problematic on so many levels. How do you stabilize it on the head? So I'm, you know, I'm going through the internet, ordering a bird cage. It has to be lightweight. Um, it has to be the size for it. Is um, that you? And uh, then the suddenly a birdcage shows up. <laughs> Quite amazing, and I figure out everything else. And what's funny is another challenge that we've had is the fact that uh, Groucho always painted on his mustache. Well, if you see the show, they're running around, and you're just literally watching the sweat. And I had to come up with something that would hold his eyebrows and his mustache on without you seeing like it running down and be him becoming suddenly a goth character and f what was ironic was that's kissable lipstick that's literally lipstick that he has that we tried it I was laughing he said 
try this. And I put some on my skin, and he put some on his face. And through the whole show, it never goes anywhere. So kissable lipstick. <laughs> it does wonders. Um, so one of the challenges of a giant musical is that you usually have a lot of um, space to stage. And we did not in this space. And, and Russell is not only, Russell Garrett is not only in the show, but he's also our choreographer. And uh, I, I warn you, it's a really weird space to try to stage in. Maybe Russell, we can talk a little bit about the challenges of taking kind of a traditional musical and changing how that works and putting it into a little thrust stage. Yeah, this definitely is um, ha poses challenges. Uh, just the the shape itself of the stage, but also as they were talking about, as Sean was talking about the the set design, how shallow it is because we've pushed everything forward, so it doesn't leave a lot of room. The the advantage of this particular adaptation of Animal Crackers is that it is only nine people. I love this style of show, uh, and it's one of the reasons why when Sean approached me about being in the show, I approached him right back and said, hey, do you have a choreographer for this? And he said, well, I don't have anyone at this point. And I was like, me? Uh, because I spend about half my career as a director, choreographer, and, and of the other half acting. And uh, I love these old shows. I love shows from the 20s and 30s that don't get done very often. Like our Long Island Lowdown is basically a Charleston type number because that was the time period that it was written and performed in. And, and we have the opportunity to do a tap number, which isn't always done in this show as a tap number, but several productions have done that. And I specifically asked Sean if we had actors who could tap. And luckily those were the two roles that had yet to be cast. So he kept looking and he found two people who could tap and sing and act, which is no small feat. Yeah, this, this uh, posed some very uh, specific challenges, but was a lot of fun. Um, probably the biggest challenge was just the fact that I was in it at the same time. <laughs> and about two or three weeks into rehearsals, I just turned to Sean and said, I'm in it. I have to learn my own show. I was working so hard to like get stuff staged and choreographed that I kind of forgotten that I, I actually had to be in it as well. And learn my music and my lines and comedy. <laughs> so I sort of abandoned the, the dancers after a certain point and said, you're on your own. Well, please come see Mark's brother, see the Animal Crackers. It closes August 13th. And also don't forget that on August 7th and 8th, we're doing our stage reading summer musical. We're going to be doing Spamalot, uh, Monty Python Spamalot, which is a great show. And so you can get information about that. It's only two nights. It's a stage reading. And uh, we have some really great people that are going to join us on that one. So please check that out and please join us for that. And thank you so much for coming.